church. Good, Good to see all of you. The sun is coming out. Thank you for bringing it out. It's been a cloudy day here in West Guilford for most of the day, but the sun is coming as we come to worship the Lord. And this is the weekend in which we fall back in time. So hopefully others won't be coming in an hour from now thinking that they're on time. But uh, Today we're uh, come and we're going to have communion together. It's always wonderful to be able to have the Lord's Supper together. For a number of months we didn't have it, but we started a few months ago, and so we're going to uh, take it together. Those who are in the sanctuary have been uh, to, uh, asked to take one of the little cups that have both the bread and the cup on it. For those of you at home, if you want to pause right now and go and get some juice and get some bread, um, we'll be here when you get back, so we encourage you to do that. A few announcements I want to bring to your attention. Wednesday, November 17th at 7 p.m., we're having a membership information night, and for those who are interested in looking into what does it mean to become a member here at West Guilford Baptist Church, we have a nice sheet like this for you to sign up on the bulletin board. Two are signed up already. It'll be about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, so it's not a long evening, and we will meet in here six feet apart, so I uh, encourage you to consider coming if you'd like to find out what does it mean to become a member at West Guilford Baptist Church. We're hoping and praying that more and more people will start to come now that things are loosening up uh, here in Canada. Some can get their, their uh, booster shot, their third shot, and so that's good news, and children are on the way. They figure before Christmas that children will be able to get their shot. So good news. We're thinking positively towards that. Next Sunday, no, in two, no, is it next Sunday? Today, yeah, next Sunday is Operation Christmas Child Return of the Christmas Boxes. I don't know if you can see on the video, but those who are here can see that some have already brought their Christmas boxes in filled and uh, so we encourage you to do that next Sunday if you remember if not you can bring it during the week Monday Tuesday or Friday and just bring them up to the front when you come and put them at the front by the communion table our call to worship today is Psalm 62 verse 1 and 2 listen to the word of God my soul finds rest in God alone my salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. What a wonderful way to begin our service. Let's come and talk to the Father together. Father God, as we come into your presence here, we ask that you may help slow our minds and our hearts down as we come into your presence. Give rest and peace to our souls, Father. 
Remind us from your word and by your spirit that you are the only one who can give us the assurance of eternal life. The only one who can keep your promise that you will love us forever. Thank you for your love and your grace and your forgiveness. Not only for now, for today, or for tomorrow, but for all eternity. We thank you, Lord. Thank you that with that assurance in our heart, we can face whatever the days bring. We thank you for the gift of salvation that Jesus, your son, provided freely through his death on the cross. We thank you that he has made a way for us to come into your presence, to be adopted by you as your sons and your daughters. Thank you, Father. We are so glad to be part of your family, the family of God. Thank you for your provision for us, Father, in every way, in good times and in hard times. And here in North America, things are going up expense-wise, and it's costing more to get gas and to get food, many things. And we've been spoiled here in that we've had so much for so long at a minimal cost compared to many places. So help us, Father, not to grumble or mumble or rumble. Help us, Father, to be joyful that we have enough money that we can buy food. We can pay for what we need. Yes, we may not have quite as much extra, but Father, help us to live thankful lives. We thank you that we live in this country called Canada. What a beautiful country to live in. We thank you that it is a free country, that we have freedoms that many in this world do not have. That as Christians, we still have the freedom to come publicly and come into your presence together. We don't have to bar the door. We don't have to be meeting down in the basement or in some barn somewhere. There are many who do. And we pray for them, Father. We pray for the persecuted church. Be with them. But help us to be thankful for our freedoms. You have told us to pray for those you have raised up into leadership. So we pray, Father, Father for our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, for our Premier, Doug Ford, for our local mayors and those who have uh, been elected to office. Father, give them wisdom. We pray that they will have the wisdom to ask you every day. Some of them may not know you, but may they have the integrity to try to do the right thing for the most people every day. Father God, we thank you that you know those amongst us who are not well. There are many that we know who are sick. And so we pray for some that we know in our community and in our church Pray for Arlene Robinson and Jody Langman, Pastor Gary Swigerman, Dan Kenny, Sue Kay, and others, Father. As we just pause for a moment, we lift up in our hearts those that are on our hearts that have not been mentioned. Father God, we also pray for those who are grieving loved ones. Uh, at any time, it's hard, but it seems that um, November is one of those cloudy, cool months that makes things harder. Be with them who are grieving. For the lonely, the despairing, the depressed, and the distraught, encourage them, Father. Give them a sense of your presence and your love. Be with them when their minds are confused or cloudy or dark, lighten those minds. Help them to look up and see you, see that you, you were there. Keep them from believing the lies of the evil one. He is a liar and a deceiver. May we not listen to his lies. We thank you, Father, for hearing all of these prayers, and we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing praises to the Lord, and then we're going to have a, a, a Remembrance Day tribute time. But before that, let's worship the Lord together.
Blood's a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and thine alone Can change all of us Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Tide my soul to save my lips shall still be Jesus made it all all to him I owe sin had led to crimson stain he washed Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin I left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Well, Jesus did pay it all. He took all our sins away, and by his blood being shed for us, we have eternal life. And we thank him for that. But once a year, we want to give thanks to those who went to war, knowing that they may never come back, going to protect our freedoms and our country. And they include people as far back as the First World War, Second World War, the Korean War, and many other conflicts that have happened since then. And they went freely. Some were drafted. They had to go, but most of them went freely. They went because they loved their country, they loved their family, and they wanted to protect the freedoms that they perceived were in danger. I think they were right. And so once a year... On what we call Remembrance Day, Veteran Days in some countries, we remember, we wear uh, a poppy, many of us choose to do that, remembering that many of them laid their lives down in a field of poppies and never came home, never saw mom and dad or grandma and grandpa again. Just today, as I was preparing for this message, Someone in our congregation sent me uh, something that he must have found on the internet. And it is written by a 14-year-old boy. His name is Joshua Dyer. And he wrote it two years ago. And in response to his teacher saying, I'd like you to write a poem about Remembrance Day. I'll give you an hour to write it. And this is what he wrote. And it's now being published in different places 14 years of age, sometimes we worry about the younger generation. Do they have sensitivity towards other people? Can they understand what sometimes great-grandfathers went through? Listen to this poem. 1,000 men are walking, walking side by side, singing songs from home, the spirit as their guide. They walk toward the light, me Lord, They walk towards the sun. They smoke and laugh and smile together. No foes to outrun. These men live on forever in the hearts of those they saved, a nation truly grateful for the path of peace they paved. They march as friends and comrades, 
but they do not march for war, step closer to salvation, a tranquil, steady core. The meadows lit with golden beams, a beacon for the brave, the emerald grass and trampled, a reward for what they gave. They dream of those they left behind and know they dream of them. Forever in those poppy fields, there walks 1,000 men. Beautiful, beautiful poem. We're going to listen to a version of O Canada that I don't think we've played here very often. It's the original version of O Canada, all four verses, and it was written originally as a hymn to be sung in churches. Now we sing it, the first verse, in hockey games and football games. Seems like we've made a bad trade in there. We're going to watch and listen to the words, beautiful views of Canada, and then afterwards I'm going to come back up and we're going to have two minutes of silence. I'm going to ask you to stand during that time, and then we're going to have a prayer of thankfulness for those who fought for our freedom. So let's um, watch, and you can sing along, certainly. You know the tune.
beautiful version of that beautiful hymn. I'm going to ask you to stand as we acknowledge for two minutes the sacrifice that those who went to war on our behalf paid for us. Father God, we thank you that we could pause just for a few moments and give thanks. Thank you for this country. Thank you for those who courageously went off to war to fight for their country, to protect this country, to protect our freedoms. Father God, we pray that this Remembrance Day, those who served will sense your well done and that, Father God, you may continue to Give them peace for their service. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. This afternoon, we're going to uh, take a break from our series, Living by Faith. We have a couple more weeks in that series. And today, I want us to look at God's encouragement in hard times, and specifically the way God encouraged uh, his servant Joshua at a hard time, a challenging time, in Joshua's life. Now, hard times are hard sometimes to put a finger on. Sometimes a hard time can be an exciting time. My father said that he joined the Navy when he was 17 and a half years of age and went overseas because he wanted an adventure. Six months later, while batting, battling down the hatches, I guess that's what they call it, in the midst of a storm, he went flying backwards and he broke his back ended up in the hospital for four months, and got an honorable discharge. Didn't have nearly the excitement that he thought he was going to have. But sometimes, challenging times can seem like exciting times. Sometimes, challenging or hard times can be the saddest times of our life. When you sit with someone you love and you know that they're not long for this world, those are sad times. Those are times that really touch your very soul. Sometimes the circumstances uh, are such that those hard times are times when we grow the most. When, when we, we look back, we say, that was such a hard, difficult time. But boy, did I ever grow through it. Many people have said that about the Depression to me. Many of them are gone now. There aren't that many left. But I remember talking to many people who lived through that. They were hard times, but they really grew and really stuck together as a family. Some didn't make it as a family. Some had broke them. But for others, their faith kept them and got them through hard times. Certainly, hard times come with a variety of circumstances, a lot of different shapes and sizes. They may be different for one person than another. Some may say, well, that wouldn't be that hard but it was really hard for the person who went through it. We can't judge other people's hard times. They sometimes come with relationship problems, where your relationship with your spouse or with your children or with your neighbors stretches you beyond almost what you can take. Sometimes they come with losses, losses of jobs, financial losses, job losses, other times with emotional hardships, your emotions are stretched to a limit. You feel like you're going to bust. You just can't take any more stress, any more pressure. For many people during the pandemic times, 
they came, the pandemic, the worst thing about it was the quiet, the stillness, the loneliness of not being able to see loved ones. Many who are in our nursing homes, that was the worst part of the pandemic, was when they couldn't see anyone. Imagine, that of course has to be a hard time. Loneliness can often lead to depression. And those feelings can often make us believe things that aren't true, that no one loves us. We're unloved. We're unappreciated. Heck, we're unneeded. Nobody needs me. And that can cause people to start thinking thoughts that are dark, dark thoughts. Today I want to look at a snapshot from the life of Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' lifetime aid, and I want us to see how Joshua faced a challenging, hard time, but he faced it with the Lord's words of encouragement. I want us to see that Joshua was not only a man after God's own heart, not only a man who supported his uh, general, the one who God had called Moses from the time he was just a teenager, but he was one who did it without complaining. When you look at the life of Joshua, you will not find him complaining at all. He is one of the 12 spies that were sent into the, into the promised land, and only he and Caleb came back and said, we can take it. You should see all the food, how big the fruit is there. It's a wonderful land filled with fruit and honey. The other 10, though, said, we can't go in there. There's giants in the land. There's no way. All they saw was dark and gray, while Joshua and Caleb saw the promises of God. God says to go, we could go. Unfortunately, they were voted down, and for 40 years, the people of Israel had to go around and around and around in the desert because of their disobedience. Finally, the day came that Moses passed from this world, and when he did, the Lord said to his people, Joshua is going to take over. And he said to Joshua, Joshua, you are the one that is going to take over. He had seen everything about Joshua all the way back to Exodus 17.9, where Joshua was chosen by Moses to be one of the men to go out and fight the Amalekites. The Amalekites didn't like the fact that the Israelites were going to the edge of their land. They wanted to get rid of them, so they wanted to go to war against them. This is before Israel had an army. This was a forming of the Israeli army. And so he said, choose some of your men and go and fight the Amalekites. And he did that, and one of those men that he chose was Joshua, his aide. Matter of fact, he put him in charge, and Joshua took the men and they fought against the Amalekites. You may remember the unusual story that tells that when uh, her and when uh, Moses' brother, and I can't think of his name right now, his brother, put up their hands, they won. They were winning the fight. But when he put, they put their hands down, they started to lose. So they know when Moses had his hands up, and so his brother and her came and they put their hands underneath them and kept Moses' hands up, and they defeated the Amalekites. And that was the beginning of Joshua leading the people of Israel into many battles. He was not only a faithful aide to Moses, but he became a mighty general. And when the time was right, God promoted him to taking Moses' place. The passage I want us to look at today is found in Joshua 1, 1 to 9. And it's a passage of encouragement directly from the mouth of God to Joshua in the midst of hard times. And I want you to think of that. How many times did God speak directly to people? Well, here's one of those times. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 9 says this. The sea well, so here we go. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, 
Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land. I am about to give them, give to, uh, into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert of Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the high tide country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to their forefathers to give to them. Be strong and very courageous and be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, there's a lot of different pep talks that you hear in the movies. One of the most famous is Newt Rockney, uh, when he gave the big pep talk to Notre Dame before they went out and won the big game. But no pep talk compares to this. This is perhaps the biggest pep talk in the Old Testament. And God is speaking to Joshua, who has been faithful up to this time, who has been a warrior for God, but now he's going to be leading the people into the promised land. And I want us to look today and see some truths in this passage. First of all, I want us to see that God was encouraging Joshua in the midst of a major change in his life. And that's what made it a hard time. And I've missed it many times when I read the story. But he was an aide with Moses from the time he was a teenager. And here he was 30, 40, 50 years later. And Moses had just died. His servant, Moses, had died. But for Joshua, it was his friend. His brother had died. Not physical brother, but someone that he was closer to than a brother. That's the first words he says to him. In verse 2, he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River. Now's the time. For 40 years, you've been going in circles, but now is the time. And we know that story. We know it's 40 years. We knew it happened after Moses' death. But this is happening in real time. This isn't found in the Bible at this point. This is what's happening. And Joshua has to deal with his grief, and then he has to get ready. He has to get himself ready and get the people ready. The people who are grieving, who had just heard that Moses is dead. And he said, now get ready. The time is now. Those were hard times. Those were challenging times. To continue to do what God wants you to do in the midst of hard times, only by the grace and mercy of God can you do that. Because you don't know where your strength is going to come from. And it only comes from the Lord. You may remember, we certainly remember, Diane and I, that Buddy, when she passed away on January 30th, it was in the midst of the lockdown. Everything was locked down. We weren't having church here. We could have a service for her as long as there was no more than 10 people. That was it, maximum. We had to organize it. Even though three weeks before, we thought, 
everybody was as healthy as anyone. Three weeks later, we were organizing a funeral in the midst of a lockdown. We knew that God wanted us to share God's goodness through testimonies. Both my girls, remaining girls, wanted to share. I knew God wanted me to share. So by the grace of God, Betty agreed to video it, and we sent it out. Hundreds of people put that they had viewed it and watched it. In the midst of what was such a hard time for us, God gave us the strength to do what he wanted us to do. And he gave Joshua that strength too. But the first thing I want us to see is that this was a hard time. Change of any kind is hard. Even good change. Remember that church at West Guilford. Because in the next six months, you're going to not only lose a pastor who's retiring, that's me, but you're going to have to learn to love and, and follow a new pastor that God has raised up. And it's actually a pastoral couple, which no one in this church during my time has ever had a pastoral couple lead them. Will there be some changes? Will it be a little different? I'd say it will be at least a little different. I've talked with Sean, and he is a good man and a wise man, and he said, my goal is for the first year to make as few changes as possible. I just want to get to know the people and fall in love with the people and have them get to know me and my family. To me, that's wisdom. That's good wisdom. I know God will provide because he is a good God. And Joshua was the right man for the time, but he was also a man. And this was a lot of change that came all at once. Remember that. Change is not easy. Secondly, God reminded Joshua that God was going to be with him wherever he went. A lot of change coming. You know, I'm giving you new responsibilities. You're gonna, I'm going to give you this land. Well, he didn't give him the deed for the land. <laughs> Some people may think, oh, well, you just gave him a deed for the land, a free, free land. He had to fight for the land. Wherever they went, they had to conquer the people that were in the land. It was not an easy, oh, just wade in and put some grape uh, vineyards in and just put your feet back and do nothing. <laughs> they had to fight for it. Give you the land, yes, but they would have to fight for it. But God's promise was this in verse 5. He said, As it was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God promises this over and over in the Psalms, in the book of Hebrews, but it starts here. As it was with Moses, I will never leave you. I will be with you along the way. I will be right there with you. So do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to not be afraid. But the promise was, I will be with you wherever you go. And he was. He was with Moses in the past, and he was with Joshua in the future, in the present, and he'd be with Joshua in the future, time and time again. What about you and me? What battles are you facing right now or you see coming up just ahead, just down the road? A good friend of mine, Dan Kenny, who attends another church, found out that he had a large growth, a six-inch round growth in his midsection. Several of his organs are all around the growth. They're not sure they can cut it out they may have to shrink it first, which will probably maybe do some harm to the organs and then try to get it out. He may lose some of those organs. He has a hard time ahead of him. So right now he has set up a prayer team of men. He used to be in men's ministry. And those men have committed themselves to pray for him in every step of the way. As he sends us an update, we are praying for him. We respond to his updates. I know in my heart, every time I see one, God says, Brian, don't just read it. 
Don't just pray for him. You send him back a private message encouraging him. I know many of those men on that list, and they are doing the same thing. God is helping him through others. You may be going through some hard times. God wants to help you through your family, but through the family of God. That's why it's so important that we stay in touch with each other. Those who are in church today and those who will be in church on Sunday and those who, for whatever reason, you haven't felt compelled to come back to church, keep us in touch. Keep us knowing what's going on in your life so we can pray for you. Don't uh, fall back into the shadows because Satan loves it when we're in the shadows. He wants us to be in the light and he wants us to be there for each other. Time and time again in the New Testament, it says, encourage one another. Encourage one another. Well, it's hard to encourage one another unless you have some sort of contact with one another. Unless you share with one another meaningful things. We have a men's group that meets on Wednesday. We have 12 men in the group, usually an average of eight or nine. And this past Sunday, we had, uh, this past Wednesday, we had about an hour and 15 minutes at the beginning of sharing, sharing about our children and our grandchildren. And it was amazing the things that came out. I'm sure that people didn't maybe intend to share as much as they did, but they did. They shared meaningful things. At one point, we stopped the sharing. We said, we need to pray for this individual right now. We need each other, men, if you're listening to this, you need other men to come alongside you when you're going through rough times. Women seem to gravitate to that a lot more than men. We need to be there for each other through those times when we're battling. Joshua, when he was battling for the Lord, must have been some tough battles. Just because you're going through a tough battle doesn't mean the Lord isn't with you. It just means that it's a tough time. Perhaps emotionally it's tough. Maybe stress-wise. Maybe you can't sleep. I've had many people say to me over the years of being a pastor, my toughest thing is I can't sleep. I can't get to sleep, or I wake up and then I can't sleep. That's tough. That is tough. Several years ago, I was on some medication for something, and my doctor felt that that medication, I'd been on it for a number of years, he should switch it. I was doing fine, sleeping okay. It wasn't, so he switched it. For six weeks, I could not sleep, and when I did, I had nightmares. It was terrible. It took six weeks to get in to see him. I said, I'm not taking this anymore. I've gone six weeks. I can't survive not sleeping. Put me on a different medication. It didn't work very well either, but the third one worked. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for that. Sometimes, though, we go through hard battles, sleeping, depression, health problems, battling health, health problems. You know, someone shared with me this week about a health problem that their spouse had battled and gotten through, but how hard of a time it was. And I said, you know, I never knew. I'm your pastor. Oh, no one knew. Our family didn't know. We didn't tell anyone. Well, that's between you and the Lord. But I'll tell you, when I go through a battle, I need you guys fighting with me. I need you praying with me. Last year when Buddy was so sick and then passed away, we felt the wings of God lifting us through the prayers of God's people. We need each other. Don't let pride get in the way. If you're going through a rough battle, let the body of Christ know so we can pray. Finally, God gave a triple command to Joshua. You don't see that too often. And the command was to be strong and courageous. Matter of fact, you think maybe God's, you know, having a moment, one of those senior moments, because he tells them three times the exact same thing almost. Verse 6, be strong and courageous. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Not just courageous, but very. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified and do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you. He will be with you. 
Now, why would he tell Joshua that? Joshua had shown no signs of being terrified. He had shown no signs of being discouraged. Why would he tell him that? Because God created him. And God knows that we're human beings, that in our human beingness, we sometimes get discouraged. Even when we're doing the right thing, even when we're battling hard, we get discouraged sometimes. And sometimes we get terrified. We just get overwhelmed, and it causes us to not know what to do, and it sometimes can cause us just to be so scared that we don't know what to do. I've been there. I think many of you have been there. It's not a lack of faith. It's not because you don't trust God or love God. Lots of times, it is just simply because of our situation, and that's when we need to go to the Word of God, and we need to go back to it, and allow the Word of God to give us the courage we need. We need courage. We need His courage. Interesting this week, I wanted to find an example of someone, uh, because it's uh, Remembrance Day Sunday, I want to find someone who was considered a very courageous soldier and see if there was anything written about him and, about it. and I didn't have to go very far to find one. He was a real deal hero, this per person. Many people had no idea uh, who he was until he got into the movies after he came back from war. His name was Audie Murphy. Some of you know that name. Some of you, who the heck was he? He was in the era of Roy Rogers, and he did lots of westerns and lots of war movies. But before he got into the movies, he was a real-life hero. Matter of fact, he got more awards and badges and medals than any other American uh, soldier. Audie Murphy, he must have been built like Samson, right? He was a big, strong guy, must have been as tall as Goliath. Some of you are smirking because Audie Murphy was five foot five. 110 pounds when he wanted to enlist, and they turned him down. You don't weigh enough. He went out, and for three months, he ate everything fattening he could think of. Went back, put on 18 pounds in three months. Wow. He feasted. Went back, 128 pounds was accepted. Joined the army, military, up front. At first couple of years, had some skirmishes, but not that much. The last year, though, he was in so many battles where many of uh, those in his battalion were killed, but somehow he wasn't. And not only wasn't he killed, he went and captured one uh, point after another, one hill after another. He was a country boy who had learned to be an excellent shot so he could get food on the table for his large family. And he knew how to use a rifle. And he was fast, and he ran like back and forth and back and forth. And people wondered, how could he run so fast in the middle of all those bullets and everything? And after the war, this is why I'm sharing, they asked him, they said, how come you were so courageous and so you had no fear, and you were cool as a cucumber. And he looked at him, and he said, who are you talking to? He said, I, wasn't, I was terrified. Same word that God says here, do not be terrified. I ran so fast and, so, and was going back and forth because I wanted to outrun those bullets. <laughs> and somehow he did outrun those bullets, but he was terrified. Sometimes God calls us, to do something for him in the midst of being terrified. Don't give in to the terror, is what it's saying here. When he says, don't be terrified, the words there in the Hebrew are, don't give in to the terror. Don't give in to the terror. Because there are terrifying things around us, terrifying times that we live through. Don't give in to it. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Matter of fact, it tells us here that we need to keep our eyes on the Word of God. We need to be striving to live for Him and to obey His Word if God's promise is going to be true. 
He's going to be with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. There's a condition here. It says, be strong and very courageous. And then right after it says, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. You want to be successful in God's eyes? Do what he says. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful in God's eyes. That's the only eyes that count. Nobody else's eyes. When we are striving to do the right thing, to stay on the right path. So that's easy, isn't it? It's easy to stay on the right path, right? None of us are ever tempted to go on the wrong path. I'm going to tell a story I've told before, true story. Everything is true, though now I can laugh at it. At the time, I could not laugh. Diane and I had just moved to Peterborough. I was managing a footlocker store. We'd been married less than six months. I was 24 years of age. I was... Same height as I am, six feet, 160 pounds. I was in pretty good shape. Every day I went jogging. Put on the new jogging shoes. I worked at the Foot Locker, manager. Bought these new shoes way back then, $120. Top of the line. Ooh, they look good. Put on my track suit, jogged. Lived near Jackson Park in Peterborough. Some of you know where that is. Jogged into the park. Went down the main path where I always went down jogging. It had rained the night before, puddles, different places, but sun was coming out. And then as I was running, five minutes in, I saw a path. It was a path I'd seen before, but I'd never decided to go down it. And for whatever reason, it went through my mind, I'm going to go down that path. It must loop around, it'll come back to it. So I went down the path, and as I did, I noticed that there were more puddles. It wasn't a very wide path, I had to jump over some. And then I came to it. There was this big puddle. It was five feet across and six feet long. I couldn't jump over it. I couldn't go around it. Could have stopped and went back. Would have been wise, right? New tracksuit, new uh, uh, shoes. But I decided, no, nah, I'm just going to run through it. I'll just run through it fast and won't even hardly know I'm there. Took two or three steps. My third step, I think, my left foot went up to here in mud. Almost fell. What the heck is that? And it wasn't just water, it was mud. And I couldn't get my foot out. And I said, well, this is crazy. I went real hard and I pushed and I got the foot out. Came all the way. And then it closed up again. Looked down and there was my sock. And I had no shoe. I thought, this is crazy. Those are brand new shoes. i got to reach down. This is all happening quick. Reach down with my left arm. I couldn't find it. Mud's flying up all over. I could I reach down with my other arm. And, and just before I put it in, I thought, oh, no, if I do that, I might not be able to get him out. And sure enough, it took all my strength to get my, this arm out. It was full of mud, and I couldn't. So I tried again with that. Tried for about 10 minutes. Finally, I got so frustrated, I took off my other shoe. And I looked into the woods, and I went, ah! And I threw it into the woods. And I came out the way I came in, off that path, onto the main path. And I started walking home, no shoes. And as I walked, joggers say hi to each other. They're friendly to each other. And as one came my way, I don't know why, but I went, hi. And he, his eyes got big and What's wrong with him? Turned around and looked at him, and he was. When I got home, went to the door, opened the door. Diane happened to be in the kitchen. She said, what happened to you? I said, oh, I lost my shoes in a mud hole. And I said, why? What do you mean, what happened to you? Look at yourself. Went and looked in the mirror. I had mud everywhere in my eyes and my hair and all over. My wonderfully new track suit was totally full of mud. I was so frustrated. I thought, I'm going to take a bath. I think it was a day off, and I must have stayed in that bath for an hour or two, just kind of. Okay, why did you let this happen, Lord? There must be a reason. 
The only reason I ever came up with was he wanted me to tell this story. And I've told it many, many times. Silly story. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength if we stay on the right path. If we don't go down the mud hole paths. If we stay in the Word of God, let the Word of God speak to us. We need to do that. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. So we need to stay in God's word. We need to obey his word and not go off and do our own thing on the right or on the left. God wants to encourage us today. He wants us to know that he will be with us in times of change. He wants to remind us that he is always with us always, day and night, and that he will help us to be strong and courageous and to fight off the terrors that are sometimes right in front of us when we stay grounded in his word, when we stay studying it and obeying it, stay connected to the word of God. We need to do that because we are weak on our own. But when we are in Christ, when we are connected to him, he will make us strong to face whatever is ahead. One of the reasons the Lord has called us to have communion together is he knew that the first people that he had communion with were just about to face major change. He was going to die on the cross for them. Major terror. Are they coming after us next? Major. So he said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. In the days ahead, for until I return, I want future generations to fix their eyes on me. The fact that I had my body broken and my blood shed for them, and I rose from the grave. I'm not dead. I am alive. Right then, at that moment, it hadn't happened, so it was fuzzy to them. And then it happened, and they did get terrified, and he did appear to them after he rose, and the Holy Spirit came and gave them great courage. Eleven out of twelve of them died as martyrs. That's what history tells us. You're not a chicken if you die as a martyr. The Lord gave them the strength. He didn't promise them that they'd live to 200 years of age. Some of them died as relatively young men. Some Christians die at a relatively young age. It's not the same for everyone. Rejected and alone, like a rose, 
trampled on the ground You took the fall and taught on me Today, as we take communion together, I want us to reflect and remember that the Lord has called us to do this in memory of him so that we can fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, well-known words we hear almost every communion service. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We you have your cups, most of you have used them before. The first little thin piece of cellophane comes off, and you should have the wafer. Let's together do this in remembrance of the Lord. Let's give thanks. Father God, we thank you that this wafer, though it doesn't look like the bread they had, represents, is a symbol of that bread, which was a symbol of the body of Christ, your body that was going to be broken for them and has been broken for us. Thank you for taking our sins upon yourself, for having your body broken for us. Let's give thanks together. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, I'm going to use this cup to symbolize it. He took the cup and he said, do this in remembrance of me. The cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this when you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, until he returns. We are proclaiming to the world and to one another, encouraging one another that the Lord is coming again and that that Lord has already paid for our sins. His blood has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Father God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus, your son. We thank you that he shed his blood for us so that we could be forgiven. Your word says, without the cleansing of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so we thank you that, Jesus, you willingly shed your blood for us. Let's give thanks together. Thank you, Lord. We're going to sing along with the, uh, the group that is going to be leading us in this last song, Beautiful Words. May it just kind of lead you deeper into his presence as we sing it together. Jesus 
strong and kind. Jesus said that if I fear, I should come to Him. No one else can be my shield. I should. Show me.